ships that are very positive, very calm. You don't have to really relate them. So relate those areas of your concern and then try to see the relationships and see whether they are meaningful for the purpose of your learning, research, or study, or whatever. And the second function of theory is to suggest policy. Oftentimes we think, you know, uh, how do we make policy? Do we make policy? Do we, do we pull them out of the air? Pull them out of the air? Of course not, because we can't do that. We, we make or suggest and make policy by looking at the situation both in reality and in terms of an understanding through a particular theory. Now, when I say theory, you, know, you can use the word theory in very loose terms, not necessarily in a very scientific term. That is a very loose term. That you have some ideas. You have some ideas in your head about the sort of relationships you see is the sort of happenings that you claim, and therefore you make policies. Remember, policies or intentions. Intentions of doing something for a problem. Two words as a solution of that problem, and two words a cause of action. The policy sets forth causes of action in order that we resolve the problem. Of course, you know, we are living in a time of crisis, global crisis, not just national crisis. But we have to think about policies that could quickly get us over the crisis. Actually, today, New Zealand has already announced there are no more COVID cases in New Zealand. I hope every other country does so very quickly by resorting to certain causes of action that are, that are appropriate of the situation. I hope we do it too. As the days go by, we're getting worried about is the increase of the COVID cases. And we are all the fifth in the world. And we are quickly, you know, quickly winning all the people to get to the first place. I guess. So we have to worry about the kind of policies we may use and the causes of action that we could change so we could quickly overcome coronavirus infections. So policy is very important because policy is what we gain from theories. Understanding theory is not anything. It's it's a very, very comprehensive understanding of the functions of the world, functions of reality, and the problem that we see, the problem that we could analyze, and the problem that could give us solutions. So policies provide us causes of action that could be ultimately the solutions to the problems. So the third function the theory does is uh, to assist in all our future research. So you need to carry on with a certain number of theories. Happily, Dorothy has 
a number of theory that we can fall back on and understand understand the kind of social science research and the kind of social science problem that we deal with. Theory in social science or research is actually the views on reality. They are types of explanations and they are indeed paradigms. They are also paradigms to observations. When I say all this, you know, you in a situation like ours today, the crisis situation, we, we attempt to view the reality and try to explain the reality. Why is it? Why are we affected by this coronavirus infections? What has gone wrong? What can be done about it? Okay, so you have a number of views on the reality. Is it within our means to resolve this problem? Why is it persistent? What are we to do to quickly remove these viruses? So our thinking, our views on reality, or perhaps take us to the explanation why we are in such crisis. Remember always, you know, uh, there's always a time, there's always a number of people who think about as a reality, think about the crisis situation, try to give explanations, and they work with everyone. You work with everyone. Now, what is a paradigm? How does a paradigm lead? Observation. Let's look at this picture. This picture is a cycle of stars. We actually begin at the observation. Because we begin at the observation on the on the right, on the left, I'm sorry, on the left. When we make your You think all theories or scientific reasons, all theories of scientific reasons. And we use scientific reason to develop theories. We do it in two ways. One, what we call the, the inductor. You can say you can observation. Yeah? Excuse me, sir. Very sorry to interrupt you. Yes, sir. Uh, your PPT is not visible, sir. Aha. Uh -huh. And your uh, voice is muffled, like a uh, fan is disturbing, I think. Participants are telling it's oh not. Oh, my God. Okay. Thank you, sir. Your PPT is not visible, sir. Not I visible. I think uh, there's some problem. But it, the PPT is visible for me. It's on. I have it on, yeah. I have it on. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. For us, visible. Very good, visible. Uh, some participants were telling it is not visible, so. Maybe, maybe. I think uh, it's very light, okay. Uh, I should have used, you know, the black layers, okay. So it's, it's all right. I hope everyone sees, okay. Listen to me anyway. And uh, there are two scientific reasons. One is inductive reasoning, the other is the doctor reason. Now I don't want to go deeper into where to give you an example, Einstein for example, or Sinibas and Ramanujan for example. They are people who were inductive. But maybe they were inductive in the beginning, but became deductive in the end. That is, 
they were inducted because they were looking at new data, okay, new variables, new situations, and new contexts. And they were trying to invent or discover by their own logical reasoning. I think uh, Einstein did his relativity theory in about a year in four papers, in four scientific papers. And I think Srinivas Ramanujan was thinking about his theorems. I believe in that he had 230 theorems in seven notebooks. And today, something like 4 million books have been written on those 230 theorems. He inductively created. Of course, you know, he uses knowledge. He uses the cultural background. He used the inferences he could get from what he learned before. And at one point in time, he was both inductor and deductor. At certain point in time, maybe when he was writing, when he was trying to find support for his work, he probably became deductor. Okay, so we use inductor reasoning and deductor reasoning to develop theories. So when we are the doctor, we are making more observations to get back to theory. And maybe we do in doctor reasoning as well. So today it's not it's not very easy to say who was in doctor, who was the doctor. Most of us are both in doctor and the doctor. Other, we are not, say, more inductive than the doctor. We are more the doctor. Okay, let's get to the next one. And you see the forms of reasoning again and the explanation for it. Deduction moves from the general to the particular. You must uh, understand uh, when we talk about science, we talk about what is science? Science is general, okay? Science is general from the particular. Understand? Science is general from the particular. Science is always generate. Science is always universal. And it it comes to be general or generic or universal from what we see as particularities, okay? When we look at induction, we see the other way. We move from the particular to the general. We move from the particular to the general. Start with the real world, then develop concepts, theories, based on what is observed, and then make theory. You have two examples. An example of theory of evolution, and also the example of distant decay in geography. Now, distant decay is not, is not yet a theory, but there are any number of supports for uh, the idea, the concept, distant decay, and the distant decay could be a theory in the geography. Now, let's look at this particular diagram in which we, we, we try to understand or practice Theory, in a way, we we go from the field to theory. We go from practice to theory. And then uh, 
This is like in you know, a uh, you observe and you know and then you do then you know further and then by doing and knowing knowing and doing you were able to theorize you're able to theorize about the situation the reality you were looking at you're actually looking at what we call perceivable perceptible phenomena and we try to explain to understand how it works and make <laughs> after all you know we make theories about how the world works and we make theories about how our life world okay our life world our social world works and we always try to validate those theories towards understanding the perceptible phenomena and towards understanding the world towards understanding the reality towards understanding our life our social life our lived experiences and so on yet so now we come to paradigm paradigm is an explanatory framework paradigm is an explanatory framework you know it's a framework we have I and mean, oftentimes you have to imagine this framework you know mentally before you can actually term it you can actually give words to it you can actually make statements about uh, the reality that you see therefore a paradigm the idea is uh, a group of ideas or the cluster of ideas that we may generate in our thinking of course, you know, in our critical thinking, okay, you know, critical thinking, there are different kinds of thinking that we do. There is a simple thinking. There is that critical thinking about a critical situation. And there is what we call a systems thinking. When we look at that, that is a, a larger, whole a larger whole cannot by explaining the parts away because there is the sum of all the parts is more is greater than the real sum of all the parts the system is more than the sum of all the parts and therefore systems thinking is much more complex so the way you know we have what we call today complex systems theory. Okay, when we take a paradigm, a paradigm is a group of ideas, is a is a cluster of ideas. Often people say it's a it's a constellation of ideas. Okay, it's a constellation of ideas these ideas provide us a framework within which we can look at the reality look at our life look at our social life look at what we do look at what we make out of what we do and so on and it provides a statement of the most appropriate way of studying an issue okay now if you take for example Example sustainable development as a paradigm. You will look into when did first emerge? When did sustainable development as an idea emerge? It emerged in I think 1987. 1987 
um, group, uh, a commission, you know, this is a World Environment Commission, okay, it's a World Economic and Environmental Commission. The, the commission put together certain ideas and they said, what we do today is more destructive than constructive because we use many resources. We use them without any discrimination. Most of what we use are non-renewable. And so they would become exhausted. They are limited, they are finite. And therefore, we have to limit our use of resources in a way that we use and benefit. And much of the same for our future generation that they could use and they could benefit in the way we did. That's why they say, you know, the world is not yours. The world is your grandchildren's. In a sense, you don't want the world, your grandchildren do. And so think about it, grandchildren. Would your children, your grandchildren have uh, the same kind of earth, same kind of environment, same kind of, you know, what you enjoyed in the future is what you're doing is hazardous, harmful to the world. Therefore, you can correct yourself. Do your activities in a way that the future, your grandchildren, your children, enjoy the world as you have enjoyed. So sustainable development has come about in the 90s, early 90s, and it keeps going. It keeps going. And we are talking about today sustainability. You take anything, we are talking about sustainability of that aspect. So uh, sustainable development has become a paradigm for the entire world because 192 countries of the world signed up the declaration at the first world summit in 1992. And they continued to sign the declarations in all other summits. And they, they promised to follow the tenets of sustainable development. So sustainable development remains today a paradigm to follow. Okay. Now let's go back to paradigm and talk a little bit about how do we generate a paradigm? Now, when you talk about science, there are two kinds of science. One, one what we call the normal science, and the other, what we call revolutionary science. It depends, you know, uh, it depends what we do. Most of the time we do normal science. And some of the times we do revolutionary time science. Maybe this is the time. This is the time when we have to do revolutionary science. Of course, you know, you know, people are looking out for a vaccine for coronavirus. And they say it could be discovered or it could be found in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay. 
But if we have to find a vaccine for COVID-19, I believe you have to do what we call a revolutionary science. I mean, what we call a revolutionary science, I believe the Einstein did a revolutionary science. Ramanujan did revolutionary science. And of course, you know, uh, in geography, we did revolutionary science in the 60s and 70s. Okay, if you look at the diagram, if you look at the, the sketch, a rough sketch in front of you, you have two extremes, the left and the right. And you have a way, you know, that that's, you know, the waves are larger in the middle and the waves are small and flatter at the extremes. And you have the word paradigm one and paradigm two, and there is in the middle revolution. You have what you call pre-revolution and post-revolution. I'm not sure whether we are in the revolutionary period now, but we may be, okay? We may be in a revolutionary period as we are looking for a number of answers for the situation today. We're looking for medical. Okay. So we are looking for a number of different things, a number of different solutions for the crisis. We are looking for social crisis, to solve social crisis, to solve economic crisis, to solve the medical and health crisis. So there are, you know, this is a kind of multiple crisis we are in. So we have to do revolutionary science. So what happens uh, during a revolution is a revolution of ideas, a revolution of ideas. You know, a very, very large number of ideas emerge. A very, very large number of concepts emerge. I think uh, sir's connection is having some problem. Right. Uh, am I audible? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Yes. So, sustainability is possibly one of the 
one of the conceptual matters from which we may have a number of anomalies, okay? But remember again, you know, uh, paradigms give us problems and they give us solutions and they give us alternatives. So one paradigm, which is problems, solutions and alternatives, give rise to another paradigm to rule a revolution and that has problems and solutions and alternatives. So every paradigm has problem as well as solutions and alternatives. Now this is very strange when we talk about a paradigm being one giving the problems and giving them the solutions. Always remember most of our solutions are ideational. Do you understand? They are ideational. They are ideas. Okay. They are ideas we are trying to do with. By doing the ideas we generate, that's why I said in the beginning, you need to have a lot of imagination to create ideas, to create ideas that are workable, to create ideas that are functional, create ideas that could give you solutions, okay? That can give you alternatives. I think in most scientific research, what is most important is to generate alternatives, to generate alternatives. I'll give you an example. If you take the IT department where people are working on any number of problems, what they call projects, okay. Sometime in any IT company, there may be one or two or more groups are working on the same problem. And each of them are given, each of them is given the problem to solve. Solve in the one way. Of course, as you see, you know, like uh, as a group brainstorms ideas. The group brainstorms workable ideas. And independently, they come to what we call say there are three groups working on a single problem, they come to three different solutions. In other words, they create ideas. Those ideas are implemented in a way, they create what we call a solution. It's not a, it's not a final solution, it's a three solution. Okay, it's a three solution, what we call a prototype. So what happens in, in the IT companies working on projects, working on developing solutions for different and good problems, they come out with prototypes. Then they test, test each of them and decide on the, the best one. And the client, the client who gave them the problem to resolve gets probably the best solution, the best, the prototype, the best one of the prototypes is made into a solution. Remember, you know, they have two other solutions, which you think currently they are not the best, but they can be made best for in any other situation. So what happens is, you know, people working on problems arrive at ideas, which are, in essence, the solutions, which are, in essence, the alternatives, like 
you had three prototypes, you know, each one was an alternative to the other. But what is the best is in its working. Okay, when you work a particular prototype, which as a group together decides is the best, is then put to use. And there are already alternatives. Science is always making alternatives. And therefore, even in geography, when you talk about problems, you generate ideas, you generate models, you create theories, you create paradigms, okay? You create alternatives, you create solutions and so on. Nevertheless, we tend to have anomalies all the way. There are elements of reality unexplained. You know, there are any number of things unexplained to us. We don't really know them or understand them. I must tell you about uh, Kenneth Boulding, an economist who was also a poet. Kenneth Boulding wrote a poem on the systems. You know, he wrote the poem like this, probably in the, if you, if you have looked at a physical geography book by Richard Choley and Bennett, Choley and Bennett, you would find his poem on systems, you know, at the verses, the stanzas of his poem, or indeed, you know, the, what he called it, the, the quotes in each of them. Each chapter starts with one pair of verse of this poem on systems. So he writes, he writes like this, a system is a black box. A system is a black box. And you know what goes in, and you know what comes out, but you do not know what happens with them. Which is very much true of our own bodies, okay? How many of us know that the human body, our own body, we know what goes in, we know what comes out, and then we know precious little about what's happening with them, and there are so many different things that happen that we do not know, we do not know how to explain. There are always anomalies in whatever we try to explain. So now we get to the practice of paradigm. So okay, hi. Uh, can you share your PPT? It's not visible now. Aha, uh -huh. it's on. Um, but oh, and I've shared it, or oh, it's all in black writing, and uh, all the paradigm itself is not in. Any problem? Anybody has? I I can see, I see it right away, and it's on. No, sir. PPT is not sir, not to be seen, sir. Uh -huh. I can see your face, not your PPT. You can see my face. Yes. I don't see it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, I'll have to go back and... Uh... So again, uh, Sir Shiva here. Okay. Uh, please go ahead and you know, share it again, sir. Go ahead and share it again? Okay. Yes, sir, yes, sir. That's what I will do. And then uh, now I have to get back to... Uh... Well... Hi. Just a minute. I'm trying to get my uh, Zoom started, and uh, I can see it is on, but then I can't really uh, share it. Where's it? Hey, what's happening? So down, you will have a share screen option, sir. Down. I don't see it, and that's what I'm saying.
So mine is miniaturized and I'm trying to see whether Oh, excellent. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. You can press on the side and see this. Yeah, I did it now. Okay. I did it. I did the uh, sharing and Are you saying? No? Yeah, yes, center. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Now we could able to see. Sir. Yes, now we could able to see. Sir. Okay, okay. Mm. To show, to... sir. All right, the screen big. Okay, okay. Yeah, go to show. Right, well, we are getting into paradigm and the use of paradigms and how do we go about doing our research? What issues we follow? I've already indicated to you the issues that we follow or the issues that follow us and what we do are essentially the anomaly that we are trying to explain away as we proceed with any kind of study or research. Okay, a paradigm forms a frame of reference. For many of us, a paradigm is not, uh, not in words, okay? Most of our theories, most of our models, and most of our frameworks are all uh, often in the head, okay? So uh, we try to uh, recall the framework. Uh, we try to recall the paradigms, and the, the nuances of the paradigm, and the intricacies with which and the paradigms work. The paradigms are also a model of understanding. Paradigm shapes what we see. It shapes how we understand. It is often resistant to change. More often, you know, people tend to, you know, keep talking about the same thing over and over and over again. I'll give you an example with no offense, okay? Uh, right away, think of one particular theory called Sanskritization theory of Yemen Sini wars in sociology. Although uh, the Sanskritization theory, you know, in there became unusable, unusable in several social contexts. You haven't seen he was, kept on working on them. Because, you know, he was the initiator of that particular theory. I find no, uh, no mistake or no, uh, you know, fault with them. No fault lies with them because what he created, he thought was the best at that time. It's actually 40s and 50s and 60s of India. And then, you know, as modernization took over India, and there were changes to the theory. So often, you know, people resist the change. Even paradigms do, do not allow people to change quickly unless you have a bent of mind that you would accept new ideas no matter where it comes from. One of the, one of the biggest problems with following a certain type of paradigm for life is actually ego. You know, that's, that's what makes all the difference. The minute you understand that there are all people who can think better, there are all people who could, you know, develop a framework better than you. There are people who could think better than you, okay? And I think your resistance to change would come down. There may still be some resistance to most of us, and then we don't want to leave some part of it, okay? Some part of us, because they have become some part of us that we don't want to leave them. 
But anyway, in social sciences, paradigms are rarely discarded. But in sciences, but in sciences, they are they are discarded. More often they're not. Okay. So for example, for example, we have Copernicus heliocentric versus Ptolemaic model. Copernicus said uh, the earth and the planets go around the sun. On the other hand, Ptolemy believed all of them go around at the earth. Okay, that's it. Took a very long time for many people, even geographers, to believe in heliocentric. Okay, so paradigms can sometimes be obstacles, okay, obstacles in your way of making better science. I think at this point, you know, it's better to look at two definitions of the paradigm and Thomas Kern writing in 1949 about uh, what he wrote about the revolutionary science, okay, the revolutionary science or the scientific revolution, the scientific revolution. He defined it as an implicit body of intertwined theories, not one, several, and methodologies, so not one, several, that permit selection, evaluation, and criticism. Okay? An implicit body. Always remember, there's also another definition of science, which says, science is in its method. You may be doing science. Okay. But the science that you do is in the method that you follow. So the science that you develop is as good as the method you have used. So remember, not one method, but there may be a need for using several different methods. That's why, you know, there are, there are any number of alternative methods that we could use, statistics, mathematics, and what have you. All of them provide you with a number of methods. And there are, of course, you know, methods that come out of thinking. All of qualitative methodologies or methodologies of clear-cut and long-term thinking on the use of the method one get to develop, get to use, and get to have and the benefits of it in terms of theories and solutions and alternatives. And the second popular definition of generally accepted perspective of a particular discipline at a given time. Now here is a point that is a paradigm is not for all the time. A paradigm is for a given time. Sustainable development as a paradigm would last for a time and then be dead. Or then may be followed, but there will be something else altogether different, a much better one, a better alternative. So it's for a given time and for a given group of people. Believe me, in a discipline like geography, not everybody uses the same paradigm. In my own lifetime, I haven't used at any one time or any one time period, a long period of time, any one particular paradigm, several. 
because you keep working on different things which will need a different kinds of paradigms. It is always important to choose different and good paradigms. Remember, there's a, there's a concept of different and good. It's necessary for any practitioner of any science to choose any given number of paradigms to be used at any given period of time. And that's why in our, a paradigm is for a period of time. It is for a, a group of practitioners and then the paradigm may be lost or maybe left or maybe discarded by the group. So that is how we know what happened. What we think happens is a paradigm shift. Paradigms establish the rules and boundaries for the way we see things. Now you get the point? They are in effect rules and boundaries. After all, you know, there is a concept of bounded space. Okay? Each one of us works within a bounded space. We live, work, okay, within a bounded space. There are possibilities that we move from one bounded space to another for a time. And we may live in another bounded space for a longer period of time. May or may not get back. So the possibility is that there are, you know, migrations possible from one paradigm to another, one bounded space to another. There's also a possibility of coming back, okay? So paradigms, because you understand the use of such paradigms and the rules and the boundaries set by them, you may pick a number of paradigms to work with at the same time, or any one given paradigm to work with at a given time and then pass on to the next. And thus, you know, there is a significant change in your thinking, in your working, okay, in your outlook. So this is what we call a radical a radical replacement of thinking and organizing all ways or doing things, which is what we do most often. Okay. Now we look at that. There are two major paradigms in the world today. One is the capitalist paradigm. And the other is a radical paradigm, a Marxist paradigm. Okay, uh, a capitalist paradigm is also what we call an establishment paradigm. Okay, and you know, in geography, you may have, like you know, you have a, you have a uh, established geography, or you have a radical geography. And of course, you know, in geography, a radical geographer saw represented by a journal Antipode. What is that? Antipode. Antipode is a journal that comes out of a UK. And their thinking is exactly the opposite of capitalist thinking. I believe most capitalist paradigm followers are merely followers, okay? And they, they follow an established geography. 
It is sometimes anti-collectivist. Okay, it's anti-collectivist. There is some amount of social Darwinism in action. There is a near Malthusianism in action. There are, of course, you know, in capitalist paradigm, people who are called liberal intervention, interventionists. They intervene very liberally. I mean, capitalism is, or capitalist paradigm is more flexible, believed by a very large number of people. It's free, it's a free market. Whereas a radical paradigm belongs to a certain group of people we may call dependency analysts or Marxists, you know, the, the socialists and communists, okay? A radical paradigm has its value, although in recent times, the radical paradigms are, you know, almost going out, okay? As against capitalist paradigm, but it doesn't mean capitalist paradigm does very well, okay? It does not do very well. There are problems. There are anomalies, as I said, but, okay. So, we get a, a history of paradigms, okay, in geography. And we very quickly look at three or four slides and because you know you could learn them. At this very point, I would like to indicate to the students and even staff to learn a little bit on from what we call the classical geography books. Okay? Classical geography books. You know, if you look at the German and French schools of geography and uh, there are any number of good works that are not available to English speaking world, not available to Indians. But the English geography or the American geography is available to all of us. Luckily for us, some of the old geographers, eminent geographers, have put together materials from French, German, Australian, and other, you know, geographies that we could read them and learn about them. For a geographer or a practicing geographer, if he does not, or if she does not, know about the classical works of geography and then not gone through any of them, it could be a shame. It could be something in a, that one cannot appreciate in our students. So as you see, geography got formalized as a discipline in 1874. Not before. Maybe geography was, you know, in practice all over the world. I remember every individual, every human being, every animal, every insect. Okay, every living being in the world use of geography, remember that, okay? Now we get to use geography just as we fall out into the world, just as we are born. That's why you know uh, there was geography, American geography, you know, uh, he said, map me no map because I carry a map in my head. Every one of us, every human being, every animal, every insect and whatever, each one of them carry a map in the head. They carry geography in the head. So geography was formalized maybe soon as 
a human being was born, or soon as an animal was born, okay, because they get to learn about the geography around them, like we do. So, when we say formalized in 1874, we intend to mean it became a global subject. Formalized in every country of the world, formalized in every educational system of the world. But around about that time, you know, uh, you would say the paradigm was uh, the French paradigm called environmental determinism. So that was, you know, uh, that paradigm was, you know, about saying the environment or the nature was all powerful. And we have already seen now, okay, in the, in the lockdown, in the coronavirus situation, that nature is still very powerful and that we don't allow nature to work on its own. And we interfere. But of course, as you go in terms of ideas and geography, environmental determinism was rejected because it could not be verified empirically. There were too many anomalies, too many things that we could we could not explain. And also it was overly racist. I believe racism is now becoming important. I can't breathe, okay? I can't breathe in courts. The well, racism has always been one, and there was racism in environmental determinism. That was one of the reasons why it was discarded in the first place. But following the demise of environmental determinism, a regional perspective emerged. It is the early 30s, early 20s, 1920s, 1930s. Like I said, one of the classic books that one should read is about in the nature of geography by Richard Hodgson. It was a book written and after 14 years of research looking into geographic literature of the world, French, German, English, American, South American, okay, Australian, Indian, okay, African, Chinese, whatever, okay, they were, he looked into all of them for 14 years of research into synthesizing the idea of the nature of geography. He published it in, in 1939. It was published by the Association of American Geographers. And 20 years later, he published another book called Perspectives on the Nature of Geography in 1959. And the, the 1959, book, Perspectives on the Nature of Geography, is a book written to raised during the 20th period book. And in between, okay, in between, he, he wrote several articles. Today, you know, where uh, Sometimes it's difficult to get a book, The Nature of Geography, published in 1939, but uh, reprints and editions that may be available in the market, or one can download a few chapters from The Nature of Geography book on, online, which I have done, in fact, several times before to read. One other book I would suggest, The English author is David Harvey's Explanation in Geography. Remember, David uh, Harvey was teaching undergraduate students in English University. 
And the book Explanation in Geography was written as a result of his teaching quantitative geography in the university to undergrad students. And it's a classic. It's become a classic because it's it's so very well written and it deals with things that are very important. If any of you would like to see it, you know, I would like you to refer to the chapters in the later half of the book. And you would find chapters talking about spatial thinking. Okay, what do they call spatial thinking? You would also see in the initial chapters, you know, the types of explanation, how explanations have emerged in geography and what sort of explanations we use. But of course, there are many other uh, books you can read. And if you think in terms of India, I don't think we have very classical works. But most of them are, you know, uh, works reworked on English or American geography. Okay, but but there are there are two English authors who were no more, but they worked on India, geography of India. It is a treasure house of materials on Indian geography. Or HK Stat, Spate and A.T. Lima. Remember this. Or HK, Spate and A.T. Lima. And it's a classical book, you know, it's beautiful to read. Especially, you know, when you read the book you will find several map interpretations actually being used in the book to develop ideas and explanations for the Indian landscapes. Okay, and they have used enormously the survey of India topo sheets. So, again, in know. In regional perspective is one they really talk about synthesizing knowledge from many perspectives. Okay. So what's most important in Richard Hodgson's 39 book is aerial differentiation. He defines geography as aerial differentiation. How do we differentiate between areas? Okay, in things we see, observe, try to understand, develop policies from, you know, different areas. Okay, so aerial differentiation. But as you know, that's one of the four traditions the geography always dealt with from the historic and prehistoric times to classical and modern times. So according to Richard Hodgson, geography was to provide an orderly and rational description and interpretation of the variable character of the Earth's surface. This is probably the elementary school definition, but nevertheless, very important even for graduates and undergraduates, even for geographers and non-geographers who tend to use geography more and more than the geographers themselves now. Not that the definition does not include any reference to explanation, prediction, search for laws, or empirical verification. We should include in any definition of geography all of these and much more. Okay. And because our paradigms have gone on to become larger and larger, complex and more complex and more complicated. Okay. And also, like 
paradigms or one that link practical and academic work in a, uh, in a sense that the geographers want to make sense of the world and try to understand, understand the world through scientific thinking, developing and generating solutions for problems, developing and generating alternatives to problem situation where we take advantage of statistical techniques such as multivariate techniques. So in the pre-60s, the paradigm was descriptive, okay? As we have seen in our, uh, the definition of hot shown. And in the 60s, analytical mathematical models, okay? The mathematic principles, mathematical ideas, statistical ideas, being precise, being probable, okay? Being able to understand in numbers and quantities and being able to interpret those numbers and quantities in a way we could explain the world of thing that we study. And in the 70s, of course, as you know, when we were students, you know, we had human environment interactions and response to environmental change. These were other paradigms. In the 80s and 90s, okay, remote sensing, geographic information system, modeling of earth systems, okay. And these are big paradigms, okay. When I say uh, geoinformatics, for example, or geoinformatic science, okay, or geographical information science, okay. So, what do we call it? Whatever way you would like to call it, it's basically technology, but technology based development of ideas and paradigms. Okay. And you know, in the 90s, more things became visible. And the inaccessible became accessible by a vicarious travel, not by actual physical you know, travel, but by vicarious travel, by virtual travel and so on. And so in the 90s, like I said, you know, sustainable development became our paradigm, paradigm for the world, not just in geography, sociology, or social sciences, but also sciences like chemistry, physics, and so on. Sustainable development is not just for social sciences, but it arose from the idea of one world, a common future. Okay, one world, a common future. We are one people living in one world, okay? So we should think about every one of them. The essential idea of the 90s was, you know, think globally and act locally. In the 20s, Agenda 21, or Action 21. Okay, in 2002, Earth Summit was held in Johannesburg. Johannesburg summit discussed about Agenda 21 and came to realize many on Agenda 21 was not accomplished or was halfway through that they believe you'll need to look at it differently. And you need to focus on the action, therefore, they came to have what they call a declaration, Action 21. Action for 21 century. Of course, you know, in the beginning of this millennium, at 2000, they have what they call 
Millennium Development Goal, five years ago in 2015, we came to have what we call Sustainable Development Goals. What were the eight Millennium Development Goals came to be 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And then Sustainable Development Goals had as many as 169 objectives, okay? So it's very, very comprehensive. It's, it's a kind of in a blueprint for the world development. It's a kind of blueprint for action for the world. How effectively we do it in each country depends on how we think about it, how we act on it, how we work with such ideas as available the, uh, the people who submitted in Rio de Janeiro first and then in Johannesburg and were meeting every five years in all kinds of different places. So in the 2010s, we have today what we call big data analytics. So big data is a paradigm today. And I'm happy to say that I was able to work on big data, on a, on a mapping and utility in our mapping project of the Tamil Nadu government for five municipalities the big cities actually and 44 small and medium towns okay and then we continue to work with those in municipalities and and small towns in respect of uh, street wonder surveys and then homeless surveys so what we dealt with in those cases and in, in mapping in you know in the case of five municipalities we worked on property and utility mapping we did a hundred person survey every parcel of land every new parcel of land in each of those cities and every utility in each of those cities were surveyed hundred percent okay so we don't really work millions of you know questioner you know uh, collector data and, and we we used a mobile app or mobile app for mobile you know for collecting data as well as you know for uh, analyses and mapping so so it was possible to use uh, the mobile tab collected data in mapping using GIS and developing now you know the 2010s are essentially a period for big data analytics okay now I think I'll uh, very quickly, if it is okay to go on for another five, 10 minutes, I would quickly run and run through what I did in my year research from 1973 until today. Okay, very, very quickly, maybe. So uh, the first thing I dealt with in my doctoral research, which I started in December 1973, completed in say in February 1976 before I joined Karul as assistant professor uh, was about distant decay and the theory of spatial diffusion. So that was my paradigm for about seven years, 73 to 80 till I got my doctoral degree. It doesn't mean I didn't use that. So way back in the 1974, I I worked on what I call marriage migration. Uh, 
uh, study, maybe I should go back to uh, this, uh, study your of in you know, uh, collecting the dresses of the brides and grooms from one village and trying to see how far away they had taken the girls or they have, you know, they have uh, what do you call the married migration is often, you know, uh, the girls, the girls come away to the boys' place or the grooms' place. So I that I published that in the geographical uh, journal that comes out of you know uh, uh, Chennai, okay, way back in 1974, and I worked on. Uh, Hello. Yes, sir. And participants are interrupting, sir. Uh, sir, uh, you can wind up in five minutes, sir. Uh, Rubina is also waiting. Sir, so can you hear me? So, are you there? Oh, sir, sir, unmute your call, please. So kindly unmute, sir. You're not audible, sir. I think uh, yes, this sir. one slide, this one slide, I would just talk about it in uh, close, okay? And, okay. And, uh, Thanks. Maybe two, three minutes. See, you're starting with marriage migration, okay? At one time in sociology and geography, marriage migration was a paradigm that was trying to look at how people, you know, make families, okay, and how marriage migration affects the lives of men and women. And of course, in geography in the 70s and 80s, spatial depiction and the methodology Monte Carlo simulation, which is exactly what I did for my PhD research. Later in uh, 1981, 83, I used the cultural ecology paradigm in, in a research in Kali Hills of Tamil Nadu, where I looked at agricultural development and also uh, what I call the traditional ecological knowledge and the use of it in terrorist agriculture. Now later, I used another project in which I worked on the okay, I worked on the provider user spatial behavior paradigm. This is essentially a United Nations paradigm, which use provider spatial analyses user spatial behavior analyses, which is essentially talking about uh, the health people, doctors and nurses and a &Ms and paramedics and so on, and the general public. And how do we understand provider spatial behavior and how we understand the use of spatial behavior because user spatial behavior is in the context of provider spatial behavior. And then we, I went on to do participatory action research paradigm for almost a decade, uh, 98 
88 or 98, I worked with Anna University on water, water resources management, especially irrigation water resource management, where I took upon myself to do participatory action research, what we call PAR paradigm. Then I moved on to a study of desertification on the rain shadow regions of Tamil Nadu, especially around Bodinaik and Oramkeni. So I took upon a paradigm called Community Action Plan Paradigm. Later, 20 years later, again in Collie Hill, I did a research on food security and traditional ecological knowledge and how biodiversity can be improved by the use of traditional ecological knowledge. So a food security paradigm with a TK and biodiversity paradigm. So later in Chennai, during the 20- 2000s, we started working with a data ecosystem management paradigm. Then, of course, community engagement paradigm a little later, just before I retired. Then for years 98 to 2010, I also used ethnogeographical paradigm. So for two years after my retirement, I used also a paradigm called social vulnerability paradigm. So then EIA, SIA, paradigm. And now, in the last few years, I've been working with big data, data mining paradigm. Okay, so uh, between 1973 and 2014, these are the number of different paradigms I have used in my research. Now a request to uh, Jyoti. Jyoti, you can uh, you can provide the participants with the PowerPoint as well as the abstract I sent to you. Okay. Yes, yes sir. I'll do that. I'll do that, sir. Uh, they can use it. They can use to learn it because there are many more things which I would like to stay away. Yes. And thanks very much for very silent listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now I quickly call upon uh, Rubina, ma'am. Uh, it's already uh, exceeding the time, so I'll call you for the next session, Rubina. So shall I start? Yes, you can share the screen, ma'am. Okay. Um, so uh, it's already known. Anyway, wish you all a good day. And before I start, I would like to congratulate the organizers of this uh, webinar series. And it, it indeed, it is a, a very good work you know, from a college like Nirmala College. And I also thank them for giving me this opportunity to scra- share the uh, screen with my guide, uh, Dr. Uh, T. Vasinda Kumaran. And uh, hopefully you will make um, benefit out of this, um, uh, this talk because I'll be uh, like some overlap will be there because certain things which I, uh, certain things need to be talked upon. Uh, so let me uh, start with my presentation now. Hope the slide is visible. Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Okay. 
So, uh, okay. Uh, so today I'll be talking about geographic research in the COVID era and what are the challenges and opportunities we have at hand. Uh, as you all know, any difficulty brings it with it challenges. And you know, when you are at the dead end, I believe that it is always a door which you have to open uh, to look into the opportunities. So COVID also, though it is a deadly virus, uh, it has also opened opportunity, opp opened opportunities for, I think, almost all of us. And we have walked through uh, places which uh, we have never uh, dread to walk before. So um, as you all know, geography, let me start from the basics because uh, I think a lot of the attendees are uh, basic geography students. So let me give you a basic uh, basics let me start from the basics as you all know geography comes under two realms you have uh, the physical geographic realm and the human geographic realm and as sir uh, has uh, pointed out earlier in his presentation uh, research in geography is essentially carried out um, being carried out during the earlier uh, years, it was it was more of a description rather than an analytical study. And as time passed by, uh, say in the late uh, middle of the late century, we can see that it became analytical. We started using quantitative techniques. And then uh, a very few of the geographers have attempted to do some research at the experimental level. So basically, uh, though every body of knowledge has uh, two, um, uh, two ways in which you can do research. One is pure research and the other one is applied research. Pure in the sense you, you do some basic research. Uh, I think Sir has touched upon that also. Uh, so uh, you are, this is driven by mere curiosity. You are trying to answer, you're adding to the body of uh, knowledge which is already existing. However, in applied research, what you do is you are making use of the knowledge that you have um, to solve the problems at hand. So all these things, I think uh, most of you will be aware. Then there are other, there are many ways in which you can uh, classify research. So in geography, we can see that most of the research are exploratory in nature or descriptive in nature and ex or exploratory in nature. Um, there is a predominance of descriptive research even now in this part of the world. And explanatory research is very limited. We rarely take a study area. We rarely go for interventions. We rarely study the result of the interventions in that area. So as you can see in the slide itself, uh, exploratory means you are doing a basic data collection of the problem at hand. You identify a research problem. You prepare a rush picture. You try to explore the research problem. In descriptive, what you're doing is you choose a sample from that area. You do a study on that area and you try to describe, explain, and validate the findings. Then in explanatory, again, you are conducting experiments. So these, uh, if you take geography as such, you know, we are far behind, especially in this part of the world. And we have to move further if we have to uh, make our own identity in the world. Then depending upon the kind of information that you're seeking, like the depth of information that you're seeking, you can, uh, you have qualitative research and you also have quantitative research. If you are looking into the uh, intricacies of a problem, the underlying issues which, are, which is causing a problem, you have to go for qualitative methodology. You have to, uh, if you want to analyze uh, the emotion, basic emotions of people, the basic attitudes of people, why people act in a particular way, why humans modify the landscape of the earth in a particular way. You have to go for qualitative research. In quantitative research, on the other hand, you are trying to portray it in the uh, form of numbers. See, there is no problem with any form of research because any form of research contributes to the body of knowledge, body of scientific knowledge. And uh, so any methodology is good enough if you are doing it in a efficient manner. Now, uh, let's quickly go into the challenges that we as researchers are facing right now. And I think almost all human beings are facing right now. We are facing restrictions and all our rights have been, have been suspended now. Our right to uh, 
uh, its right to uh, be in the public and you know share space right to social interaction has been questioned so there there is there are steps and, and these steps we just cannot avoid because uh, we need to decrease the frequency of infections and in kerala we have something called sms that is easy to understand because you are asked to use a sanitizer uh, a mask or um, or to keep a social distancing in order to bring down the uh, numbers or number of covid cases so uh, see even that even that word sms as sir pointed out in his presentation this is an innovative way of uh, uh, doing it and uh, uh, you can see the picture break the chain picture and it means you are breaking the chain so it, it is an innovative idea which was applied by uh, a group of people in to make the people aware a group of scientists and uh, policy makers to make the common man aware of the issues relating to covid so um, and i think the major aim of any research should be to apply research for common good and for the benefit of not only humankind but also for the earth so we know that there is decreased social interaction and there is innumerable steps for human life and we are dealing with a highly now as i've uh, told you earlier can you is it clear is it clear uh, i hello it's clear ma'am you can continue you can unmute and start ma'am you can go ahead ma'am What's happening, Rabina? Hello. Uh, Uh, I think now you can hear me. Yes, yes, you are audible. Hello? Now you can hear me. You are audible. Yeah. Okay. 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 Now, so we, as I've mentioned earlier, most of the research that we carry out, even now, it is more of the script. Uh, exploratory or explanatory research and you make use of uh, uh, data collection methods in which you interact with the community or in, you go to the field and um, collect information so geography is essentially a field based discipline and this has actually increased our challenges the, to the geographic researcher so in as i've told you earlier you have two broad realms in which you do research either in human geography and within the umbrella of human geography you have other disciplines also and uh, you have challenges mainly in human geography because you are dealing with people and here your social interaction has been suspended so that is again a very big problem so if you are using techniques like uh, uh, questionnaire surveys or uh, focus group it is actually limiting you just cannot collect information from the uh, community uh, because of the current state of affairs 
So that is a major issue that we are going to face and we're facing right now. And I think three of my students are into social, social research and they are doing research in human geography. So they are going to face a lot of problems, though the time frame has been extended. We don't know how far it is going to last. However, if you are doing some, some other sort of study in human geography, say for example, meta-analysis, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Vasanta Kumaran was saying, um, Hashan wrote Nature of Geography taking 14 minutes, uh, 14, uh, sorry, 14 years to collect the information. Now, uh, what you have at hand is technology. The technology is so, so much ahead that it will take only a few years for you to t write a textbook like that. I'm not joking because you have tools like uh, um, tools uh, like uh, citation network analysis, which can be performed using um, platforms like Vosvir, Getty, you know, uh, network analysis platforms, which will help you to uh, identify the key areas in research, who are the key authors who have done research, uh, provided you have an access to Web of Sciences or Scopus or any such database. So if you are working in any university, you can make use of uh, such things and actually you can go on and publish uh, works on anything like that. So um, that is quite uh, possible. If you're doing a meta-analysis, you, uh, you are not interacting with people. The only thing you are doing is you are analyzing the textbooks which have been published and which is actually available in a database. We are uh, living in the world of big data analytics, so data is available everywhere. And the only problem is that we should make use of. So we are having challenges, but at the uh, because the primary data provider for most of human geography research is other people. So and here you, the people are restricted. Then um, now, what are the emergence? What are the opportunities? As I told you, when you dig, reach a dead end. You have only two options. You can either jump off the cliff and fly, or you know your uh, career ends there, or your research ends there. Now there are new techniques emerging. These techniques were already existent, but it has become more popular mainly because of COVID. We were not looking into that direction, and because of that, uh, you know our uh, view was uh, view was um, actually limited. So you have. Um, techniques like Google Forms, like Google, uh, tools like Google Forms and others, online polls, social network analysis. And as I've mentioned earlier, you have uh, n number of uh, citation network analysis uh, software. Even in any network analysis uh, open so software, you can conduct uh, citation network analysis. And then you have to bring it to uh, ask to you if, if you are familiar with R, and you can conduct a study. So new areas of research. The second thing is that new areas of research is also emerging. That is something which is promising because we are looking into avenues which we were no not looking into in the past. So increasing uh, scope for applied research. As uh, we all know, there is uh, research on the kind of viruses. Okay, So on the uh, uh, kind of virus vaccines available and how we can combat this COVID uh, pandemic. So we don't know what is going to happen. But as geographers, that is the field of biomedical uh, research. They are doing that. But what as geographers, what we can do? One thing which I noticed, you know, in the next slide, I will be showing that. Um, there has been an in increase in interest in medical geography. And that is something which is good. And COVID is not the only disease which is causing problems to us. There, has been pan they have, there has been pandemics. Uh, throughout the history of humankind. If you look into the history of humankind, every century we, we had at least two or three pandemics hitting us. So uh, I think the, our generation is facing this for the first time. And maybe because of that, we are thinking that this is something gruesome. They have survived. And though I believe that this is nature's way of reminding us that you know, we have uh, limitations, you know, we have to come, but there are uh, ways in which you can come out of the limitations only by following nature's rules. So there is, uh, but all these opportunities that I've mentioned to you um, uh, is possible only if you are having some amount of internet and digital literacy. See, this is a, a Google form which I prepared. I, I think last week I prepared this just to get uh, an uh, get an information about the 
uh, online preferences of my students, like what they prefer and which mode of teaching should be adopted. It took me hardly, uh, say, 12 hours to collect this information from 35 students. Uh, because one thing is that they were all digitally literate. They were very fast with internet, using internet. And this helped me to collect the information in the entire data. I didn't do any of these charts. It was automatically generated from Google Forms. And if you further want to do uh, analysis, okay, you can go in for uh, uh, opportunity. Like there is an opportunity for uh, recording responses and there is a tab. Uh, you go to responses tab and there is an option for downloading it in the CSV format and as you all know once you have it in the CSV format so you can do it do anything with it any analysis with it you just have to take it to a spreadsheet and do analysis and if you have a location tag to it again you can bring it to a DIS platform so this is as I mentioned earlier see, we are concentrating on COVID and the problems COVID is causing but this is an opportunity for medical geographers. You can use such methodology for uh, understanding. Ma'am, you can unmute. I have muted all the participants. Kindly unmute and talk. Ma'am, kindly unmute, ma'am. You are still muted, ma'am. You unmute. Um. Unmute, ma'am. Yes. Your audio. Uh, can you see my video? I cannot see my video, my uh, presentation. A presentation is not shared. Uh, presentation. Presentation is not shared. Yeah, I'm not able to. I think you have uh, closed that option. No, I have not. You can share, ma'am. Okay. You just click on your presentation. I don't know. Uh, so can you see my screen now? We can see your face, but not your presentation, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Can you see my screen? No, it is not yet shared, ma'am. Not able to. Yeah. Uh, so can you uh, now it has come. So, uh, as I've told you, so if you want, if you are doing researching on a population which is uh, internet literate, which has, uh, who has uh, smartphones at their disposal, you, know, you can always use Google Forms as an option and you will be able to collect information. But again, this is not going to work if your, the community of the group of people you are working with don't have, have access to internet. And the next uh, uh, thing which you can do for qualitative data collection is Zoom and uh, Cisco WebEx. But again, there are limitations. As I've mentioned, you 
accessibility is again a problem. But however, if you are doing research on something like um, academic uh, research or academics during geographic academics during um, uh, COVID, you can uh, come out with, you can use uh, platforms like Zoom or Google Meet or Cisco WebEx. So these are some of the uh, challenges and opportunities which uh, COVID has, the COVID reader has presented to us. And uh, in physical geography also, most of our research are, I think, explanatory to a certain extent and applied in some cases. And here the primary data provider uh, for, uh, you know, we should be happy that it is not the people, but however, our movement is restricted. We cannot travel to such places and we don't know whether we'll have to take permission to conduct field surveys. If you are um, uh, conducting your research in uh, areas which are vulnerable and such areas, you need to get permission. And again, you're going to face problems. And uh, traditional survey equipment are, are used and we can usually we use field survey equipments like total stations or GPS and other GIS platforms to collect information and analyze it. Then uh, you have other cloud data sources, which we uh, now use. And as uh, has mentioned, we are living in the world of big data. And we have mobile apps, which help us to do this. So here again, so you'll be wondering, like, what are uh, the problems? And then what is the problem? If we are able to access, we are, if once the lockdown is lifted, we'll be able to go to those areas. I don't think so, because if you are uh, doing research on forest ecosystems, it is going to be quite difficult for you to get permission from the forest department and the tribal department. And so that is, again, one problem which we are going to uh, face. However, if you reduce the scale or resolution of your study, if you are from micro to macro, if you are doing a study at the micro level, you are going to have problems. But if you are doing it at a macro level study, you, uh, you are not going to have any much problems. But again, uh, whatever uh, opportunities that I have mentioned, uh, everything is at stake, mainly because of issues relating to data privacy and data piracy. See, uh, I've shown you, um, uh, I uh, shown you in the previous slide about the Google Forms and how I collected data using Google Forms. But here, what is the, the problem is uh, the data is given to a third party also. We are sharing the data with, with a third party and we don't know what actually they're going to do with the data which is being um, given. And as you all know, data is one of the things which is the most expensive thing in the world now. And we have to take into account such things. So research or initiatives should be there uh, to protect at least the data which is being collected for uh, research. Uh, so that is one way in which uh, we can handle the ethical issues which are going to arise. So now the opportunities, so these are challenges which I have mentioned. So you have opportunities, you have n number of data sources. Uh, it is not the era in which we used to do research. Now you have uh, data sources available. So this is something which is available uh, in um, Sentinel, from Sentinel, and I hope many of you are aware that you can download any imagery uh, according to your needs from Sentinel of the European Space Agency. So uh, this is a Sentinel 5P imagery, a recent one, uh, which is pre, uh, which is taken uh, during the pre-lockdown period and the post, and during the lockdown. Uh, so from the first imagery, you can see the nitrogen dioxide tropospheric uh, column. You can see how it has come down. Uh, the skies have actually cleared up. You can see the troposphere has actually cleared up of nitrogen dioxide. In South India, I think only Chennai has a little bit of a uh, problem. So th this kind of data is at your disposal. Uh, the only thing is that you should be ready to make use of it. So any researcher who's listening to it, don't uh, make it, don't make COVID an excuse to uh, extend your research. You, are, you have any number of possibilities. Take it as an opportunity uh, to change your ways of thinking and adopt the new techniques which is at your disposal. And uh, you have climatic data also, which is uh, uh, available. The European Space Agency is also giving it away. Then other uh, options in India, we have Bhuban and other things which gives you say satellite images. So uh, these are some of the opportunities which are available for uh, use to me. So uh, as Sir has already pointed out, we are actually in a period of uh, paradigm shift. We are undergoing a paradigm shift. We are actually living in the 
period of revolution. So if you look back into uh, what has been happening in the beginning of the century, almost a century back, 1918 to 1919, we had the Spanish flu. In around, 19, around the same period, Kerala witnessed uh, the worst deluge also. And even now, we are facing the same climatic scenario. We are uh, having almost the same problems. And we should also understand one thing. 10 years from then, uh, Einstein found out the a theory of general relativity. So that is the kind of thing the scientific community can do. So we are in a shift of, uh, we are shifting. And if we do, if we miss the bus, we are not up, a discipline is going to stop it. So we have to make use of the technologies which is at hand. So as you all know, paradigm uh, is a collection of ideas which is predominant for that particular generation. But that doesn't mean that we should stick on to the same old ways of things. We should always go for it. any development uh, is possible only if you are ready to shift your viewpoint. Still, the uh, theory of gen uh, relativity was found by Einstein. We used to believe that uh, Newton was always right, but Newton was proved wrong by Einstein. So this is an opportunity for us to uh, sit inside our houses, actually ponder on so much of scientific wonder and think about the ways in which uh, uh, to deal with the problems that we as geographic researchers are facing. So here again, you have a methodological shift from ground-based to field-based corona or during the COVID era, we are confined to remote sensing based or web just based or mobile GS based and or AI based uh, technologies. In human geography also, the same thing. You have online social media based analysis which you can conduct. But how far it is feasible, uh, you know, you can come to know only uh, once you start using these technologies. So there is a, uh, and uh, to add to this, uh, I would like to add one more thing with sustainable development. This is an initiative, Res responsible research and, inu in, uh, and innovation is an initiative uh, uh, of the European Union. And I think this, is, this should be something which should be carried out in every country. So responsible research and in, uh, innovation tool was created to build effective cooperation, cooperation between science and society. So this means that you are uh, any form of research you know, carries some responsibility to the society in the sense that it should be useful to the society uh, and whatever technology that you are go going to use, it is not going to go cause any harm to the society which you are studying. So the issues and challenges associated, uh, so there is, now we can see this transition. Whatever uh, in this COVID era, what can we as geographers do? Uh, to address this you know, scenario. But you know, we have many limitations, but only if you take the first step, we'll, we'll reach the last step, we'll fall down, it is okay, we'll get up and we'll start walking again. So uh, on the note, since I have a short presentation, I have not explained so many things within the um, thing because I have to stick to the time frame. Uh, let me end uh, my presentation by this uh, quote by Rene. Uh, who is uh, who has written wonderful works in responsible research and innovation. And according to him, technical inventions up to modern time are still considered with a view on who is in control and who can make use of it. Negative consequences of the technology are notably associated with who can use or misuse the technology rather than with the properties of the technology itself. So any technology, as I've mentioned earlier, you might be reluctant to use Google Form. You might be reluctant to use uh, Cisco WebEx or any other form uh, because there are, every technology has flaws. Only when you start using it, you can rectify the flaws and move ahead. So I think uh, with that note, I think I'll uh, end uh, the session and hope if, if you have any clarifications, if you need any clarifications, I'll, I'm always there. You can contact me. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rubina Ma, for a wonderful presentation. And I would like to thank uh, Kum, uh, 
TV sir also for a wonderful presentation and uh, he was explaining. I was uh, very happy to hear again uh, deductive, deductive reasoning. Actually, I, I, I had a throwback memory uh, sitting in his class. Um, then field practice to theory, then perceptions, explanation, uh, lots of things. Uh, I, I don't know, he's a library of uh, knowledge and uh, uh, knowledge in geography. So thank you, sir. Uh, we will quickly uh, take one or two questions. Actually, uh, participants are uh, posting questions in the chat box. One or two we will answer, maybe. Like uh, students uh, were asking, uh, we are seeing many uh, like uh, experts who are writing books in geography. They are not from, they are not from a geography background. Like or a botanist, so they have become experts in geography. Why we geographers are not becoming like that? Uh, and what is the scope of learning geography? Uh, and are we getting jobs apart from teaching field? Are we getting established in fields like oceanography or any other fields? Um. I think will sir answer this question or I'll answer after him maybe uh, because seniors oh, if he's not there I'll answer you do, you do Rubina okay uh, Rubina. Uh, okay I'll tell you what is the main reason the thing is uh, we are the blank the blunt truth I must say is that we are lazy we are lazy as geographers. We are lazy. I think each generation of geographers, we are becoming lazier and lazier. You have n number of opportunities at your doorstep. We never had something called internet like we had, but we didn't have access as you have now. And if you look into YouTube is another uh, platform you can look into. You can learn anything from YouTube. And I think it's your interest, the interest that uh, you have to take. And you should feel inspired also. Uh, that is something which is missing. Attitude is something which is very important. And the others have interest in geography and they are conducting the search in geography. And I've seen so much of good work coming from their end also. Okay, so it's up to you, sir. Oh yeah, I think uh, it's not we are lazy. It's if we are not good writers. <laughs> I feel uh, most of us feel backward right. Okay. It's not that we cannot write. I've seen, uh, for example, Rubina herself is a very good writer. But I don't know, after so many years of teaching, getting into teaching, you know, being busy with that, they may not do it. I still do writing. I just finished a uh, geography book for nine standard. It's still not published out. So uh, I think it's a it's, question of time to sit down and write. Yeah. And write what you can. You know, uh, before you start, you have a feeling, can I write this? Can I do this? No. You can't always do. Yeah. I don't think there is, uh, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a shortage of writers in geography. There are many, many, but they don't do it. Especially, you know, geographers in the South don't work at all. I think they feel bad about writing. <laughs> I don't know. I don't feel bad about writing at all any time. That is also- so there, there was one other question. There was somebody asked who um, yeah. asked a question, why there is a paradigm shift? I would like to answer, when you shift your paradigm to some other, that is a shift in paradigm. So if they do it world over, that is a shift, okay? So paradigm shift can happen any time. This is probably a good time to happen, okay? Yeah. Any other question, maybe? Uh, there was one more question, uh, I think it is to Rubina. Uh, how do TIS mapping help uh, to fight COVID-19 uh, or during the COVID-19, how GIS mapping helps the survey? And kindly highlight about use of big data in COVID analysis. Question posted by Dr. Sridhar. 
Okay, uh, see, if you are looking uh, in the case of Kerala, uh, we can see that uh, you, you look. You should look into the government of Kerala website itself. You can. You will get the answer of how well you can use. See, every information is uh, actually given. Like, which is the hotspot? Like. Whether it is a containment zone, whether it is not a containment zone, so GIS is now on the web, so it is accessible for the com common people. People are becoming more aware, and that is at the micro level which I'm speaking. Um, but I don't know whether there was uh, I don't know whether any um, there was a call for uh, geographers to actually volunteer for such a few joined, but not many. But if we had more people joining it, I think it would have been much more successful. Only very few students actually volunteered for that, that work. See, once you use COVID, there are other uh, pandemics, there are other diseases also, especially in the case of uh, Kerala, we have lots of uh, communicable diseases we face, especially during the rainy season. We can use the same kind of uh, uh, thing which we have used for COVID also. And now with Arugya Setu, the mobile app, I don't, uh, somehow I have certain problems with that app also. Uh, I don't believe that that app helps you to uh, understand. It helps you in this disease surveillance. At least you know which is the hotspot. You should, the places which you should avoid while traveling, in, even in conducting exams. You know, you just have to click into the Government of Kerala website here just to know which are the hotspots and to actually um, arrange a separate room for students. So that is the kind of application. You don't have to ring up anywhere. It is at the click of a mouse it is available and it even shows you the location i think i have answered your question uh, sir if there are uh, class clarifications needed yeah, uh, uh, hello i yes i want to tell you something about you know one of the things we we are working on a gis application of uh, coronavirus infections in tamil nadu what we are finding difficult with is essentially the trajectory. See, it's, it's difficult to get data on the and the origin, origin of uh, COVID cases, and they travel, and they're getting into, say, India or the states as they may be. The trajectory is difficult to map. Otherwise, you know, you have, you have data you can actually fall back uh, on and then you are having daily data. Yeah, uh, location having... data. Locational data is a little difficult to get. But otherwise, you know, in terms of number in certain places, you, know, you can always get data. Uh, how about, uh... The exact location is difficult to get. Maybe Setu can help. I believe there is an app now which is called IGIS. They have done some work in Agra some months ago, not now. And they have talked about this particular app, which can be uh, you know, loaded onto the pile of COVID patients. So it could tell us about who they meet, where they meet, okay, where they are how they travel, you know, the trajectory, and uh, who are the contacts can, you know, it's, it, it's very good, a uh, very good kind of app. But I'm yet to see the use of it on a larger scale, except in Agra. They showed us what they did in Ag Agra, okay? So there are, there are some means available to trace, trace the trajectory of these. I think we need to have this trajectory very important because you know we want to uh, how the wave of invasion, okay, wave of infection, a wave of invasion occurs is most important, okay. How it has occurred in the beginning, how it is occurring now within the countries or within the states is more important. Not actually have data that we can rely on okay that's one of the problems thank you thank you very much sir i hope uh, all the answer i mean questions have been answered anybody with a 
questions specific questions if they want to ask sir or rubina ma'am madam i am dr sridhar yes sir i have a retired hydrogeologist know, yeah. Yeah. hello sir yeah hello hello how are you all <laughs> my professor is there professor vasant kovran long time and, long time sir <laughs> Thanks and the the professor rubina is also <laughs> there my colleague ex ex colleague rather so my fundamental question Not is professor yeah <laughs> uh, okay my fundamental question is uh, see as rubina said uh, none of us are uh, lethargic or uh, lazy but one thing is uh, yeah, including me nowadays many of the sciences are becoming interdisciplinary yeah whether you take geology yeah. whether you take geography or whether see when we are discussing about uh, covid 19 it is going to be a medical geography or a health issue okay such things happen in multidisciplinary approach that is many of the sciences are integrated or become integrated like flora fauna if you take it is covered in geography as well as in geology but basically it is done by a zoologist or a botanist so that is why i am telling you many of us are really integrated persons like professor tv sir or rubina or mr jyotirmay whoever it is we are all integrated scientists thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir for your comments anybody else want to join and ask questions any other questions please so i think uh, that's all sir uh, we will wind up for today we will move on to the uh, formal thank you very much thank, thank you thank you very much i enjoy i now invite I enjoy the session thank you very much thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you all thank you all attendees thank you sir <laughs> I'll now invite uh, Ms. Sri Lakshmi for a formal vote of thanks. Sri Lakshmi, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can go on. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Okay. So, very good afternoon to all, uh, respected chief guests and my dear participants. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. I, on the behalf of the Department of Geography, extend a very heartfelt thanks to all the speakers for gracing Uh, your work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today a big thanks to uh, dr t vasant kumaran former professor and head of the department of geography university of madras for sparing his valuable time with us and sharing your thought on paradigms in geography issues and opportunities it was indeed joyful listening to you sir and i have to admit that our spectrum of sustainable thinking has widened with your talk thank you sir i must mention our deep sense of appreciation for dr rubina ta assistant professor department of geography university college trivandrum for her explanation about the geographic research in covid era its challenge and opportunities yes madam as you rightly pointed out we geographers can play a pivotal role during these times and thank you for your enlightening words thank you we are grateful to the college secretary principal vice principal and other management members for their encouragement and support in organizing this webinar i would like to acknowledge our heartfelt gratitude to all the participants who have been who have taken their pain to bear with us for the past two hours in spite of all the technical issues it's a constant encouragement that enables us to do such programs once again i thank everyone for their support thank you one and all thank you sri lakshmi so with this note uh, we will wind up the meeting thank you very much sir once again for joining me for thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank you rubina ma'am also thank you kept, uh, kept you waiting for a long time <laughs> thank you so much for joining thank you thank you all thank you all participants for joining thanks a lot